So welcome on stage, Ida Tin, co-founder okay. and CEO of Clue, the world's fastest growing female health app. Ida is here with us to illustrate why, why data will revolutionize global female health. All right, so. <laughs> it's going to be the very analog version, but maybe that's the better one. So I'm Ida Tin. I'm CEO and co-founder of Clue. We are a startup based here in Berlin, um, working on an app called Clue. It's an app to help women track their cycles and understand what's going on in their body. Um, maybe just two words about why I started thinking about this, which I did in 2009. Um, I had been in relationships since I was 16, so many years. Uh, and I tried to be on the pill and didn't work very well. I had a lot of side effects. And, um, and at some point I was really like, why is it that nobody has innovated in the space of family planning since the pill came out in the 50s, almost 70 years in the history of technology, that's a very long time. We've put people on the moon since then and still women don't know what days they can get pregnant. That made me wonder. And I thought if I could take information about the body and put it on the phone, that would be the perfect kind of heart of that user experience of accessing that data. So I believe that f working on educating women about their bodies is one of the most meaningful problems we can work on because it's such a foundational part of human existence, right? Without menstruation, there would be no humans on the planet. Um, so we know that um, UN have set up as a millennium goal that all women should have access to information about um, reproductive health and they should be able to have the kids they want when they want to. It's a, it's, a, it's a human right to have family planning. However, since these goals were set up in 2005, almost a billion women have had an unwanted pregnancy. So we still have a long way to go. And what I see and what really inspires me right now is that we have this unique combination of computing power, the phone. We have a whole host of sensors giving us data about the body. Um, and we can do this um, personalized um, gather collection and, in and give insights to a user on a platform that so many people have now. Um, in fact, there's more women with access to a phone now than access to family planning. So what we can do is that we can inform women through this platform and give her insights that are, actu that are actionable um, and help her understand what's going on so that she can make good choices for herself. They don't give up easily here. Yeah? I like that. <laughs> Maybe we'll get the last slides. And the point is really to enable women to live full lives and healthy lives together with having this biology that we have that I think many women will experience kind of can set up like limitations to what we can do, especially around the world where there is a lot of taboo around this. And what we want to do at Clue is to help women and their partners live full life. And again, just when you can control when you have babies and how many you have, then you can put them to school, you can educate them, you can stay in the workforce. So it's really the foundation of a lot of good development cycles that we want to see globally. So let's see, right now, um, Clue is, I'll just say a little bit so you have some stats around, around the product. So we are in 11 languages. It's available on iOS, Android, and the Apple Watch. Um, period tracking apps is the second biggest category in fitness and health. So if you think it's a niche, it's not a niche at all. It's actually a huge category. Um, we are ranked right now number three in the US um, health store for period tracking apps. Um, we've raised 10, 10 million um, dollars from some of the, or from very good investors, to make that short. And we are 35 people, very international team sitting here in Berlin. And we've had um, lots of media, yeah, all over. So, 
Another thing which is really important to mention when we talk about reproductive health and female health is that there's a very big emotional comp uh, component to this because reproductive health connects us some of the most central areas in our lives, our sexuality, our identity, our families, um, and also power structures in society. So it's a really, it's a very, well, it's a central part of life, basically. Um, and we see that people often start tracking data around their health to understand the, f the biology, you know, why do I have these headaches? Am I normal? Am I healthy? But what that keep people engaged over time is the more emotional side of things. It's that ease of mind of like, ha, huh, now I get it. Now I understand what's going on. And I think that is something which is really key to know and understand is that the, the emotional side of reproductive, reproductive health and female health is, is a massive part of living well with our biologies. And reproductive health is a, and female health is a really long journey. It starts with a woman having her first period and then maybe trying not to get pregnant for many years and trying for a baby, maybe having problems getting pregnant. Then you go through a pregnancy, you go through breastfeeding maybe, um, and all the way through menopause. And in between, there's a lot of maintenance. People have, 15% of women have PCOS, which is a condition that is related to your cycle. So there's, there's just always stuff going on, and you never really quite figure out the system, because the second you have, think you've figured it out, something changes, and you still don't really understand how your body works. So it's a huge part of public spending as well. Female health is really its big business, and there are a lot of products around female health, but very few of them are digital. So, one of the things that is so fascinating about this time is that now we have um, a lot of data, and we need data um, so that we can do the predictive analytics we want to do, we can give the insights we want to give, um, and really take this whole part of life and transform it into data points, not just making it kind of digital. And it's not about having a digital calendar. It's about transforming a part of life into data points so that we can analyze them and understand it much better than we did before. So just to give you a sense of scope. So um, when we look at research right now and we see what studies have been made, some of the, the two largest studies that was happening over long periods of time um, had between 650 and 2,700 women in them. And the, and the first one tracked 30,000 cycles, and the last one tracked 275,000 um, menstrual cycles. And this is the kind of data that um, our textbooks is based upon. So when you go to the library, you read a book about female health, this is the kind of scope, this is the kind of data that these textbooks were based on. And right now, we get literally millions of data points every month. So it's a completely new scale. And this is, of course, very exciting for researchers. And we're working together with um, Oxford, Howard, Columbia, um, Stanford, so some of the best researchers in the world, um, because it's a big part of our vision and mission to really help move science forward. And what it does on the consumer side is that it, help, it helps us make our predictions more accurate so we can tell a woman better what is about to happen with her body. Um, it makes us able to do smarter health correlations so that we can see how that headache you're suffering from is related to your cycle or that bleeding pattern, we can recognize that maybe you have endometriosis. Um, and we can do better preventive care. We can see, oh, it looks like, you know, you might have a at-risk pregnancy or many other things. On the academic side, of course, they can move research way, way faster than they ever were able to before. Um, and on the healthcare provider side, it means that we, ha we raise this awareness that every patient is unique. This is a big debate at the moment that most research is carried out on wide young males because they don't have cycles which messes up the results. <laughs> but of course that's a big problem. So this awareness that every user is really unique or every patient. 
uh, is very important. And we can diagnose much faster, which is, of course, important for the outcome of the treatment. Um, and we can see when symptoms start um, um, emerging. So it's people can opt in to be part of this research, or they can choose not to have an account and not have the data go anywhere. Um, but many, really, most people, they say, if my anonymized data can help move science forward, I think that's a good thing. And we're very grateful for that. Um, and on that note, I think it's really important to say that we do not sell user data. This is not what we want to live from. Um, we, we live and die by the trust of our users, right? You don't, if you don't want to enter your data into the app, it just, you know, we are out of business. So really having this clear, very clear agreement between the user and us as a company, what do you give, what do you get, is really, really key. And on that note, I think it's very important that companies like mine um, create a business model that's transparent so that people understand, you know, where is my data going? Um, and I, we do have competitors that actually do sell the data, so it is a relevant conversation to have, um, and that's not what I want to do, <laughs> basically. Um, yeah, so that was a very, very brief, without slides, version of what I wanted to say. Um, I think we should just have a conversation, because it's like, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> So, any question? Please uh, use the microphone. Um, Patricia, oh, yeah. may you? Or, ah, finally got the microphone. There is the first, the first question. Here. Ah, okay. Hi. Um, ah. Thank you for Clue. It's super useful. Um, uh, you mentioned that uh, one of the benefits of having additional data is that you can improve your pr sort of predictive algorithms. To what extent is that something you actually want to include in the app? Because on the one hand, like academically and just from a problem point of view, I can see that being incredibly interesting in terms of saying like, hey, these symptoms could actually indicate this thing. On the other hand, as a user, as a consumer, suddenly that feels very uncomfortable to me. I feel like, wait, no, I don't, I don't want this app to start telling me like, hey, you surprise you have this disease. Um, or, and th I think then the idea of, wait, okay, who really does have access to this data becomes a much more pressing issue because it's one thing when it's just me putting in random data points. It's another thing when I start to realize those data points are telling a story about me and my health. Mm. So just to repeat, so it's optional. If you don't want the data to go anywhere, they can stay on your phone with the benefits and disadvantages that that has. Um, so I think one of the key things of building Clue is to understand how do, you, how do you make it just right for the user, right? So that kind of feedback is something that we take very, very serious and we, you know, seriously and we listen to. Um, and if you don't want the app to tell you that, hey, something looks a little off, maybe you should go see a doctor, the app won't do that. But we do hear that a lot of people, they might walk around with a condition that gives them, you know, a lot of discomfort and they don't know. And for these people, it is actually very helpful to have somebody say, you know, maybe you should go talk to a doctor. We won't diagnose because we can't do that. Um, we are not a medically um, certified app, so that's, you know, that's a line we will not cross. Um, I do appreciate that sense of, like, how does it not start feeling it knows too much? Um, and I think that is something that we really have to, you know, it's like when we have an advertisement in our stream that just looks too well, like, <laughs> you know, targeted, we like get a little uncomfortable. Um, and how do we do that with the body and something that's very, because on the other hand, I mean, my mom got breast cancer, right? It would have been great if somebody had, you know, told her earlier. So it's like, how do you balance these two? It has to be in a, you know, something we two figure out together, basically. <laughs> yeah. I think there was a question there. And I guess, oh, no, I guess. <laughs> actually, I have three questions, if that's okay. Um, we have time. Go ahead. Uh, pretty easy to answer, I guess. One, um, you mentioned 11 countries. 
at the beginning? Um, 11 languages. We are in okay. 190 countries. Okay, could you, what are the, like, where is it most often used, the app? In which mm -hmm. countries? So oh. US is our biggest market. Um, then comes Germany, England, Latin America is big. Um, but yeah, because it's very driven by where we do activities to grow the app. Because um, my idea was in terms of countries where access to healthcare is a bit more difficult than in first world countries, it might be even more helpful. Absolutely. This ties in a bit to the second question, I guess. Um, goes into your direction as well. Could you tell us a bit more about the diagnostics part? Because for me, it's a bit hard to imagine how it actually works at the moment. Does it really give like active tips? Please think about that, think about this. So mm. just yeah, get so a better feel. Uh, I'll take the number two question first. So I don't feel my job is done till everybody on this planet can understand what's going on. And so there is a big challenge. So how do you get to people that might have, so we, did, we just did uh, three weeks of research in South Africa, for instance, and people in low income communities, they actually do have even smartphones, but they don't have a data plan. Like they can't afford to send and receive SMS. So, so, um, so we are working on developing potentially something which is more conversational uh, UI model, so more like a bot, <laughs> um, that we can, so they can use the service without having to transport a lot of data. Um, and I think there's a huge opportunity of actually getting to people that have phones, even if they're not connected. So I think it's, you know, we, we can really get to hundreds of millions of women. We really can. Um, and about the diagnostics, so, we are still early. I mean, we can, we can, um, is it this thing clicking? Okay. Um, we can do, we can do some things and we have a lot that we do kind of under the hood that is not on the, in the product yet. Um, we, so I think one of the first thing that people will see in the product is recognizing endometriosis and PCOS, which are two very common diseases or conditions actually. Very last question, sorry. <laughs> um, about the business model, because you said you don't want to sell user data, could you say one, two sentences about that? How does it work at the moment? Um, yeah. I mean, you said you get like a $10 million of funding, but... Yeah, so it's been a strategic choice not to try and monetize yet, because we believe that the biggest opportunity is to have a lot of users and then we can figure out what to do. But we have many ideas, and I think the first very simple premium feature will be um, optimizing the app for fam natural family planning to make it really helpful. It, you can do it now, but we can do better and more, and that is something that I think some people will want to pay a little bit for. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so, next question. I think uh, you, want a, you had a question here in the first row. Patricia? it was almost the same that he asked, but maybe you can give some concrete figures about the numbers of how many women in Africa or in third world countries use the app? So I don't have them on top of my head. Um, and again, I will say that a lot of our growth is um, guided by where we do most activities. Um, but I mean, just an example, we had a YouTuber talk about Clue, uh, Clue in Saud uh, Saudi Arabia, and we saw a huge wow. spike. Um, so I think Actually, I've been surprised at how well the app seems to translate culturally um, across the world. Because we, you know, build it for America and Europe and kind of, that's the design language it has. But it, I think it's, you know, a woman in the Philippines or a woman in India or a woman in South Africa, they'll, you know, they'll f have, get value from using the app as it is right now. I don't have an exact figure on how many people in Africa, but we have not, you know, we don't, th we think that a bot is maybe a better product fit for Africa right now. So we haven't pushed the product that we have because we don't think that's the right fit yet. But, but what, one thing which is really important to say is that the data we collect here and the intelligence that we can build around understanding the data here, we can feed into much simpler platforms. So when we process data that is generated here on on the app and all, you know, where you can enter a lot of different data, it's like a rich data set, we can understand things and we can take that understanding and feed it back to a user who is on a much simpler platform so that everybody benefits from what we learn even if they don't have the full experience. 
Maybe, maybe I missed it, but how many users do you have in total all over the world? We have uh, more than 4 million active users right now. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. Another we question. We have still two time. minutes. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies first. Um, just a very short question. Does it work on BlackBerry? Like me being from South Africa, the most phone used is BlackBerry. <laughs> mm. No, it doesn't. Sorry. Next feature. <laughs> there was a question here. A very short question as well. Uh, can you tell us something about sensors that are being used for tracking? And what do you think about that? Yeah, it's something we think a lot about. I actually originally started out this whole thing thinking about sensors, so something I'm very interested in. And we keep looking into everything we can find to see you know, what is being developed. Um, there are different you know, versions of temperature, which is helpful, but I really think the world is ready for the next leap generation. Um, I think heart rate could be a very interesting one because it's you know, so easy to get. Um, we're doing um, research to look at Fitbit right now because it's basically the same thing you can see on the body that the heart rate goes up a little bit after you ovulate, when you ovulate and after. But I think the real challenge is figuring out something that can tell us uh, you know, five days before we ovulate that we are about to ovulate. And to do that, we kind of, it, right now you have to look at like the molecular level um, and that is still challenging in a home diagnostic way, um, but it's coming. And I think what we are getting better at is taking lots of different kind of noisy data streams and making sense of it. So it's, I think, in my mind, I've gone from thinking that it's very much like a sensor play to thinking it's much more data play. It's much more taking all the passive streams that we have. But if somebody comes up with like the perfect sensor that gets us just the right data points, you know, I'll love it. I hope I'll be in a position to partner with them. That would be a dream scenario. And actually on that note, I want to say one, one last thing maybe, is that I really, I really think and hope and want to get to a point where we can develop a contraceptive which is not based on hormones. And we're not there yet. Um, as I said, you can use national family planning and it's okay, but I don't think it's a mass kind of solution to a mass huh? problem. So, you know, we keep pushing for that, but I, I'm very excited about that, you know, it will come. Yeah. Thank you Thank so much. This, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining and us here maybe your just I want to say that we are building a feature for the partner or partners oh, or perfect. You know, moms and dads, so keep looking, it'll it'll come soon. And I don't have a Blackberry, so I may use it. <laughs> okay. Yeah.